All right, guys, we're on chapter 11, part two, chapter 11 of Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Fraud, larceny, rape, a brutal connection with the Alice from Linen Service. I was brooding on this tale as I eased the white whale into the Flamingo parking lot. Fifty bucks and a week in jail for just standing on a corner and acting curious. Jesus, what kind of incredible penalties would they spew out on me? I cheeked off the various charges, or I checked off the various charges, but in skeleton, legal language form, they didn't seem so bad. Rape? We could surely beat that one. I never even coveted the goddamn girl, much less put my hands on her flesh. Fraud? Larceny? I could always offer to settle, pay it off. Say I was sent out here by Sports Illustrated and then dragged the Time, Inc. lawyers into a nightmare lawsuit. Tied them up for years with a blizzard of writs and appeals. Attach all their assets in places like Juno and Houston. Then constantly file motions for change of venue to, to Quito, Nome, and Aruba. Keeping the thing moving. Run them in circles. Force them into conflict with the accounting department. Timesheet for Abner H. Dodge, chief counsel. Item $44,066.12. Special outlay to wit. We pursued the defendant R. Duke throughout the Western Hemisphere and finally brought him to bay in a village on the north shore of an island known as Culebra in the Caribbean, where his attorneys obtained a ruling that all further proceedings should be conducted in the language of the Carib tribe. We sent three men to Berlitz for this purpose, but 19 hours before the date scheduled for opening arguments, the defendant fled to Colombia, where he established residence in a fishing village called Guajira, near the Venezuelan border, where the official language of jury prudence is an obscure dialect known as Guajiro. After many months, we were able to establish jurisdiction in this place, but by that time, the defendant had moved his residence to a virtually inaccessible port at the headwaters of the Amazon River, where he cultivated powerful connections with a tribe of headhunters called Gibaros. Our stringer in Manao was dispatched upriver to locate and hire a native attorney conversant in Jabaro, but the search has been hampered by serious communications problems. There is in fact grave concern in our real office that the widow of the aforementioned Manao stringer might obtain a ruinous judgment due to bias in local courts far larger than anything a jury in our own country would consider reasonable or ever sane. He's just saying like that's what <laughs> they would have to give up pretty much. Indeed, but what is sane, especially here in our own country in this doomstruck era of Nixon, we are all wired into a survival trip now. No more of the speed that fueled the 60s. Uppers are going out of style. This was the fatal flaw in Tim Leary's trip. He crashed around America selling conscious expansion. He crashed around America selling conscious consciousness expansion without ever giving a thought to the grim meat hook realities that were lying in wait for all the people who took him too seriously. After West Point and the priesthood, LSD must have seemed entirely logical to him. But there was not much satisfaction in knowing that he blew it very badly for himself because he took too many others down with him. <laughs> too many others down with him. After West Point and priesthood, LSD must have seemed entirely logical to him. Not that they didn't deserve it. No doubt they all got what was coming to them. All those pathetically eager acid freaks who thought they could buy peace and understanding for three bucks a hit. But their loss and failure is ours too. What Leary took down with him was the central illusion of a whole lifestyle that he helped to create. A generation of permanent cripples, failed seekers who never understood the essential old mystic fallacy of the acid culture. The desperate assumption that somebody, or at least some force, as tending that light at the end of the tunnel. This is the same cruel and paradoxically benevolent bullshit that has kept the Catholic Church going for so many centuries. It is also the military ethic, a blind faith in some higher and wiser authority, the Pope, the General, the Prime Minister, all the way up to God. One of the crucial moments of the 60s came on that day when the Beatles cast their lot with the Maharishi. It was like Dylan going to the Vatican and kiss the Pope's ring. First gurus, then when that didn't work, back to Jesus, and now following Manson's primitive instinct lead, a whole new wave of clan-type commune gods like Mal Lyman, ruler of Avatar, and what's-his-name who runs spirit and flesh. Sonny Barger never quite got the hang of it, but he'll never know how close he was to a King Hell breakthrough. 
The Angels blew it in 1965 at the Oakland-Berkeley line when they acted on Barger's hard hat, con boss instincts, and attacked the front ranks of an anti-war march. This proved to be an historic schism in the then-rising tide of the youth movement of the 60s. It was the first open break between the greasers and the long hairs. Stupid kids. It was a great first break. It was the first open break between the greasers and the long hairs, and the importance of that break can be read in the history of SDS, which eventually destroyed itself in the doomed effort to reconcile the interests of the lower working class biker dropout types and the upper middle Berkeley student activists. Idiots. Nobody involved in that scene at the time could possibly have foreseen the implications of the Ginsburg KC failure to persuade the Hells Angels to join forces with the radical left from Berkeley. The final split came at Altamont four years later, but by that time it had long been clear to everybody except a handful of rock industry dopers and the national press. The orgy of violence at Altamont merely dramatized the problem. The realities were already fixed, the illness was understood to be terminal, and the energies of the movement were long since aggressively dissipated by the rush to self-preservation. Ah, this terrible gibberish, grim memories and bad flashbacks looming up through the time fog of Stanyan Street. No solace for refugees, no point in looking back. The question, as always, is now? Like now what, pretty much? I was slumped on my bed in the flamingo, feeling dangerously out of phase with my surroundings. Something ugly was about to happen, I was sure of it. The room looked like the site of some disastrous zoological experiment involving whiskey and gorillas. The ten-foot mirror was shattered but still hanging together. Bad evidence of that afternoon when my attorney ran amok with the coconut hammer, smashing the mirror and all the light bulbs. We'd replace the lights with a package of red and blue Christmas tree lights from Safeway, but there was no hope of replacing the mirror. My attorney's bed looked like a burned out rat's nest. Fire had consumed the top half and the rest was a mass of wire and charred stuffing. Luckily the maids hadn't come near the room since that awful confrontation on Tuesday. I'd been asleep when the maid came in that morning. We'd forgotten to hang out the do not disturb sign, so she wandered into the room and startled my attorney who was kneeling, stark naked in the closet, vomiting into his shoes, thinking he was actually in the bathroom and then suddenly looking up to see a woman with a face like Mickey Rooney staring down at him, unable to speak, trembling with fear and confusion. She was holding that mop like an axe handle, he said later, so I came out of the closet in a kind of running crouch, still vomiting, and hit her right at the knees. It was pure instinct. I thought she was ready to kill me, and then when she screamed, that's when I put the ice bag on her mouth <laughs> let me show you the picture before i continue this is his attorney bending over naked throwing up and she's right there it's funny <laughs> yes i remember that scream one of the most terrifying sounds i'd ever heard i woke up and saw my attorney grappling desperately on the floor right next to my bed with what appeared to be an old woman the room was full of powerful electric noise a tv set hissing at top volume on a non-existent channel i could barely hear the woman's muffled cries as she shrugged to get the ice bag away from her face but she was no match for my attorney's naked bulk and he finally managed to pin her in a corner behind the tv set clamping his hands on her throat while she babbled pitifully please please i'm only the maid i didn't mean nothing I was out of the bed in a flash, grabbing my wallet and waving the gold policeman's benevolent association press badge in front of her face. You're under arrest, I shouted. No, she groaned. I just wanted to clean up. My attorney got to his feet, breathing heavily. She must have used the pass key, he said. I was polishing my shoes in the closet when I noticed her sneaking in, so I took her. He was trembling, drooling vomit off his chain, and I could see at a glance that he understood the gravity of this situation. Our behavior this time had gone far past the boundaries of private kinkiness. Here we were, both naked, staring down at a terrified old woman, a hotel employee stretched out on the floor of our suite in a paroxysm of fear and hysteria. She would have to be dealt with. What made you do it, I asked her. Who paid you off? Nobody, she, she wailed. I'm the maid. You're lying, shouted my attorney. You were after the evidence. Who put you up to this, the manager? I work for the hotel, she said. All I do is clean up the rooms. I turned to my attorney. This means they know what we were... This means they know what we have, I said. So they sent this poor old woman up here to steal it. No, she yelled. I don't know what you're talking about. Bullshit, said my attorney. You're just as much a part of it as they are. Part of what? The dope ring, I said. You must know what's going on in this hotel. Why do you think we're here? She stared at us trying to speak, but only blubbering. I, 
I know you're cops, she said finally, but I thought you were just here for the convention. I swear, all I wanted to do was clean up your room. I don't know anything about dope. My attorney laughed. Come on, baby. Don't try to tell us you never heard of the, the Grange Gorman. No, she yelled. No, I swear to Jesus I never heard of that stuff. My attorney seemed to think for a moment, then he leaned down to help the old lady to her feet. Maybe she's telling the truth, he said to me. Maybe she's not part of it. No, I swear I'm not, she howled. Well, I said, in that case, maybe we won't have to put her away. Maybe she can help. Yes, yeah, she said eagerly. I'll help you all you need. I hate dope. So do we, lady, I said. I think we should put her on the payroll, said my attorney. Have her checked out, then line her up for a big one each month, depending on what she comes up with. The old woman's face had changed markedly. She no longer seemed disturbed to find herself chatting with two naked men, one of whom had tried to strangle her just a few moments earlier. Do you think you can handle it, I asked. What? One phone call every day, said my attorney. Just tell us what you've seen, he patted her on the shoulder. Don't worry if it doesn't add up. That's our problem, she grinned. You pay me for that? You're damn right, I said, but the first time you say anything about this to anybody, you go straight to prison for the rest of your life. She nodded. I'll help any way that I can, she said, but who should I call? Don't worry, said my attorney. What's your name? Alice, she said. Just ring Linen Service and ask for Alice. You'll be contacted, I said. It'll take about a week, but meanwhile, just keep your eyes open and try to act normal. Can you do that? Oh, yes, sir, she said. Will I see you gentlemen again? She grinned sheepishly. After this, I mean. No, said my attorney. They sent us down from Carson City. You'll be contacted by Inspector Rock. Arthur Rock, he'll be posing as a politician, but you won't have any trouble recognizing him. She seemed to be shuffling nervously. What's wrong, I said. Is there something you haven't told us? Oh, no, she said quickly. I was just wondering who's going to pay me. Inspector Rock will take care of that, I said. It'll all be in cash, a thousand dollars on the ninth of every month. Oh, Lord, she exclaimed. I'd do just about anything for that. You and a lot of other people, said my attorney. You'd be surprised who we have on the payroll. Right here in the same hotel. She looked stricken. Would I know them? Probably, I said, but they're all undercover. The only way you'll ever know if it's somebody... The only way you'll ever know is if something really serious happens and one of them has to contact you in public with the password. What is it, she asked. One hand washes the other, I said. The minute you hear that, you say, I fear nothing. That way, they'll know you. One hand washes another. <laughs> she nodded, repeating the code several times while we listened to make sure she had it right. Okay, said my attorney. That's it for now. We probably won't be seeing you again until the hammer comes down. You'll be better off ignoring us until we leave. Don't bother to make up the room. Just leave a pile of towels and soap outside the door. Exactly at midnight, he smiled. That way, we won't have to risk another one of these little incidents, will we? She moved toward the door. Whatever you say, gentlemen. I can't tell you how sorry I am about what happened, but it was only because I didn't realize. My attorney ushered her out. We understand, he said gently, but it's all over now. Thank God for the decent people. <laughs> she smiled as she closed the door behind her. <laughs> you guys are fucking funny. They're a good team, man. They're a good fucking team.